All right, grab your Bible there. Would you turn to the book of uh, 1 Samuel? 1 Samuel chapter 17. This is week number three in our series in the life of David. How many have been enjoying the series thus far? Good, 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 good. 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're going to start reading in verse 17. 1 Samuel 17, 17. You're like, where in the world is that? Right before 2 Samuel. Did that help you? All right, good. 1 Samuel chapter 17. And when you get there, just give me a loud amen. amen. By the way, I haven't done this in a long time. Grab your Bible there and hold it up in the air. Uh, keep your spot there because you just found 1 Samuel. Keep it up. Simon says keep your Bible up in the air and keep it up really high. And I want you now to look around. This is so cool about our church. Simon didn't say put it down yet. I saw you put yours down. Yeah. Ushers will be coming by escorting you out of the service. Just kidding. Uh, I just want you to look around all these people that are committed to the Word of God. I want to tell you I have nothing to say outside of this book right here. I mean, we didn't come to church to listen to a man speak. We came to listen to the Holy Spirit speak to us. Simon says you can put it down because your hands are getting tired. Uh, But I'm so excited about this book. How many are excited about this book? Uh, If we're not excited about the Bible, then man, why don't we just pull out like Home and Garden Magazine or Sports Illustrated or Hunting and Fishing or whatever, but we didn't come to to study any of those books or Reader's Digest or Cosmo. We came here because we're fired up about the Word of God. How many are fired up about God's Word? And I love it. Every time you get into the Bible, even if you read things over and over, how many have ever read like the same passage and you're like, I never, ever saw that before? And that happens to me all the time. In fact, it happened to me this week as we're looking at one of the most famous stories in the Bible, the story of David and Goliath. How many have ever heard the story before? Come on, get your hand up. Um, if you're not, you don't have a pulse if you haven't heard David and Goliath. And uh, this is a great story. I pray that God would show you some new things this week uh, as it relates to this story. So why don't we just go ahead and pray, and then we're going to get into the message. Sound good? Lord, bless your word. Amen. Amen. That's it. It's todo. No mas. You don't have to pray long prayers. Nothing in the Bible about praying long prayers. God hears short prayers. Aren't you grateful for that? Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 17, as you turn there, uh, title of the message is Giant Killers. Giant Killers. Someone say Giant Killers. Um, I want to talk about facing giants, not the same uh, giant that David faced, but a different kind of a giant. There are people that are sitting next to you today, you have no idea what they're going through. They're facing a giant today, Uh, a financial giant, a physical giant, a relational giant, a marital giant, a parental giant, and uh, the same God that brought victory for David uh, 4,000 years ago is the same God, this is going to be a great place for an amen. I haven't said it yet, is the same God that's going to bring victory over your life. Can I get an amen? Amen. And I believe that. I've been praying for that. I've been contending for that this weekend, that God would be a giant killer in your life. And uh, and, uh, how many know we all face giants? We face giants. I want to explain that in just a second. I received Christ in 1985. You know part of my testimony. Ten months later, I went to Bible college, and I didn't know anything about the Bible at all. And I was surrounded by a bunch of PKs, which is pastor kids and missionary kids that knew a lot about the Bible. I played basketball uh, for uh, four years at Westlake High School, two years at Moore Park College, and then I went to Bible college. I didn't even think they had a team, but they had a team, and that's a different story. But a friend of mine, my first year, said, hey, I'm playing in a rec league uh, with uh, my office, I was wondering if you want to play, and I'm like, I'm in, and so we played in this rec league. Uh, Nobody on our team was a Christian except myself and my friend. Nobody on the other teams were Christians, and uh, I remember this one game we were playing, and uh, here's what I've discovered about pickup basketball. Look at me. When you go down to the gym, like at the Y or LA Fitness, most of the guys that play have no idea how to play. They think they do, but they really don't. You get a lot of football players or water polo players that had a dream about playing, but they don't really know anything about basketball too much. And uh, what they watch LeBron or Kobe on TV, and they think they're the next Kobe Bryant or whatever. So I was playing in this game, and I'd go up for a layup, and this guy on the other team is really stocky and muscular. And I'd go up, and he'd basically, like, tackle me. And I'm like, you can't do that. This is basketball. And I would... I shouldn't have done it, but I would like talk back to him like, you, blah, blah, blah. and he would say some stuff. And the whole time, we're 40 minute game, we're just back and forth. Blah, blah, blah. And I know I should have been a lot more humble than that. And I, I know I shouldn't have given an attitude, but I already told you, don't look at me in that tone of voice. I already told you I was barely a Christian, probably not even a year serving the Lord. It was just back and forth for 40 minutes. You this, you that, blah, 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 blah. and it wasn't cussing, but close to it. And uh, we were just kind of jawing each other. And at the end of the game, we won. Yes, thank you, thank you. I thought I'd get more than that. Let me try it again because you already had, you should have had your Frappuccino by now, shouldn't you have? And uh, we won. Yeah, yeah. 
And, uh, but the game wasn't over because I, we were going to like uh, uh, shake each other's hand and I just heard, hey, number 11. And I turned around and when I turned around out of nowhere, this guy cocked back and boom, hit me. I could still right on the side, my right cheek right here, that ball. So like, what did you do? Well, I got down on my knees and I just said, God, please forgive. No, I didn't do that. I went after him and we were like wrestling around. It was such a bad testimony. I wish I could take it back. How many have ever done something you wish you can take back? Like, this week, okay? And so I just, but we were rolling around. I'm like, what a bad testimony it was. And here's the point of the story. The point of the story is I had no idea. I mean, we were jawing back and forth, but I had no idea that when I heard number 11 turn around, I would get hit in the side of the face. In other words, I wasn't ready for it. And how many know life can be like that? Has anybody ever just been going about your day? You wake up early in the morning, get in your car, and on the way to the office, there's an accident, or you get pulled over, or you get a, a phone call of some kind, wasn't prepared for it, wasn't ready for it, but it came anyhow? Anybody in the room? And I want to talk about that. How many know there are some things, some dumb things that we do? Forget it. I'll, I'll say it. I do. There are some, some bad decisions I have made, and I have to suffer the consequences for that. In other words, I've done dumb things. I've done stupid things, and I've had to pay a consequence for the dumb choice that I've made. Anybody else? Don't leave me on the stage right now. And so sometimes, here it is, sometimes we face a fight because of dumb things that we've done. Other times, look at me, other times we face a giant, we face a battle. It's not because of anything we've done. It's just because we're alive. By the way, do you know there's a lot of things in our life we did not choose? How how many got to choose your parents? He just came out of the womb and you got what you got. He could have been a crackhead or a congressman, but you didn't choose. How, how many got to choose like, I got to be, I, I chose to be Latino. No, Asian, no, African, no, no. You came out of the womb that way and in God's sovereignty, that's what you got, right? You didn't wake up one day and say, today I think I'm gonna be Filipino. No, you, that's what you got. And, and, and isn't it funny that people are jealous of us, mad at us? attitudes with us, and it's not even something we chose. Think about, if you're a good-looking person, you didn't go down to Zara and purchase that. That's how God made you. That's how God made me. (laughs) Just kidding. So you got haters in your life, and they hate you for nothing you even did. Just, you didn't choose, so, but sometimes I I choose things, and I, I face a giant because of a dumb thing that I did, right? Think about Regardless of the baby, the color of the baby, the ethnicity of the baby, black or red, brown or white, they come out of the womb. And I've never met one kid yet. I've been in a lot of delivery, right? right? I've never had one kid come out of the womb and he's like, <laughs> this is awesome. No, they came out crying. They came out in a fight. And I came to church to tell you today, if you're a born again believer in Jesus Christ, you came into this world in a fight, You didn't even choose to fight, but because you're a son or a daughter of the Most High God, you are signed up for the fight, and you are forced to fight giants. You're forced to fight giants. So, look at your Bible there, 1 Samuel chapter uh, 17. I want to start reading in verse 17. 1 Samuel 17, 17. And before I start reading, let me just say this. If you did not bring your Bible today, it's an awful Sunday to not bring your Bible. That's the first thing. Uh, The second thing, if you typically like me to read five or six verses and then come back at the end and give you a couple points, this is another bad Sunday to come. Here's how this sermon's gonna go down. I'm gonna read a couple verses, stop. Make some comments, read a couple verses, stop. Verses, stop. It's just gonna be very obnoxious, like you're driving a stick shift, right? You're like, can he ever read more than two verses? No, not today. Come next Sunday and it might be different. But So if you don't have a Bible, you need to find a friend with you. Otherwise, you're going to be staring at me for 30 minutes and it's going to be an awful thing. Okay, So find somebody in the chair in front of you. Unless you're on the front row, there's a rack underneath there. Pull out your Bible. And if you don't know where to find it, look in the index while nobody's looking. 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'm going to start reading it, verse 17, when you're ready. So if you're ready for me to read, just say go. The Bible says, now, Jesse... This is week three in our series. Jesse was David's son. David's a teenager. Said to his son, David, take this ephah, it's a bushel, about 36 pounds of roasted grain and these 10 loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Take take along these 10 cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. They are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. 
fighting against the Philistines. So let me just kind of get you up to speed. I told you I would stop after a couple of verses. So David, he's a shepherd boy, remember? Week number one, uh, he's just an ordinary shepherd boy, ordinary David, extraordinary God. And so he's just taking care of the sheep. And here in 1 Samuel 17, his dad says, hey, your brothers are out in the, in the field, they're fighting the Philistines. That's the enemy, right? And so here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna pack up a lunch, some peanut butter and jellies, throw some cheese together. You're, gonna, you're not doing anything except delivering food. You're like Uber, okay? You're gonna deliver some food, you're gonna drop it off, and then you're gonna come back. Got it? He's like, I got it. That's all you do. And so check it out. He, all he does is deliver food, and when he delivers food, he finds out he's in a battle that he didn't choose. Which brings me to my first point, write this down. Number one, write this down. Point number one, giants appear. Giants appear. Giants appear in David's life. Giants will appear in our life. So, because they appear, I must, here it is, I must face it. I must face it. Let's go back to verse 16. Giants appear, I must face it. Let's all say it together, ready? Giants appear, so what? I must, great, thank you all 13 of you. That's great, awesome. Verse 16. Here it is, for 40 days. How many days? 40. Come on, say it out loud. 40. That's gonna be really important when I get to the end of the message, I promise you, 40 days. The Philistine came forward every morning and every evening and took a stand. Every morning and every evening for how long? 40 days. Interesting. I mean, anybody have a bad day like once in a while? Like a ba one bad day is not a big deal. I've had a couple bad days back to back to back. That, that stinks, but it's not the end of the world. I've had a bad week before, but even in that given week of a bad week, I've had some ups in the middle of downs. Anybody else? But can you imagine for 40 days, morning, every time you wake up, bad day, throughout the day, bad day, at night, bad day. Why? Because every time you wake up, there's a giant there. Now here in the text, it's about a nine foot guy, but in our lives, it's a different kind of a giant. And if you've ever gone through a long season of a trial, health, finances, marriage, kids, whatever, I mean, you know, day after day after day, I have endurance and perseverance for three days or seven days. 40 days is a long time. So you say, Steve, when you talk about giants, what exactly are you referring to? Great question. Let's define it. Ready? It's coming on the screen. A giant is anything in my life that is so overwhelming that when I look at it in the natural, there seems to be no way out. There seems to be no way out in the natural. I don't know how my marriage is going to turn around. The doctor just gave me bad news. I don't, I don't know, outside of the touch of God, the hand of God, it just seems like I'm going to get progressively worse. My kids are so far from God in the natural. It looks like there's no hope for my kids. That's a giant. A giant is not, hey, we went to in and out after church, and then the line was like 25 minutes. It, that's not a giant. Turn to somebody and say, that's not a giant. <laughs> Teenagers failing a math test. That's a bummer, but not a giant. It's not getting in an argument with your wife on the way to church. Has that ever happened? Oh, you have like a holy, spiritual, perfect family, right? I told you, that's what my wife and I drive separately. Uh, that, that's not a giant. To get into tiff at work, to, to, to have the flu or a fever, not a giant. A giant is anything that as I look in the natural, it looks like there's no way of overcoming this. That is the giant. And let me just tell you, they're coming. Giants are coming. I'm, I'm talking to all people that are new in Jesus. Don't just think because you raised your hand, came forward, went into a prayer room, that all the giants, listen, they're coming in your life. I want to prepare you for it. It's not when, if they come, it's what? Jesus said, hey, be, in this world, you will have persecution. You're going to have to suffer in this life. Giants are coming. You got to face it. They're coming. Not if, when. I started playing racquetball about six years ago, and just a little blue or a purple ball, and my friend said, when you get hit with a racquetball, it hurts. I'm like, There's no, I ain't getting hurt. I'm, not, I'm definitely not getting hit. And I, because I'm kind of quick and small, I get out of the way. And I remember the first time I got hit with a racquetball, you're like, come on, man, it didn't hurt that bad. It's, but when you get hit like 150 mile an hour, in fact, there was a pro at the gym that hit me like in the back fat one time, you know, that back fat right there. Or if you get hit on the inner thigh, <laughs> and I was able to avoid it for a couple days, a couple weeks ago, but eventually I got hit. Listen, you cannot play dodgeball with giants. They're coming. They're coming in your life. 
So giants appear, what? I must, I must face it. Here, here's a giant. You've been at your job for 35 years and they call you in tomorrow. Say, hey, you probably heard, but Amgen, we're, we're, we gotta make some cuts and I, I know you've been there 35 years, but we're gonna let you go. That's a giant. When your kids tell me, stop bringing me to church. I don't wanna go to church anymore. I don't, I don't wanna serve your God. Forget Jesus altogether. I'm out of here. That's a giant. A giant is... Do you know last week at Telios, I had three friends of mine, two are pastors, one's a worship leader. In the last couple of years, two pastor friends, their wives, and my friend who's a worship leader, his wife, all three of the wives said, I'm out of here. I'm out of the marriage. I'm out. I don't want to be married to a pastor or worship leader. I'm out. I'm gone. That's a giant. That's a giant. So God, what do I do? And the natural looks like there's, there's no hope in this situation. Giants appear, I must, I must what? I must face it. Do you know when my wife and I went on staff at a church, we were youth pastors at this church. After about a month, the senior pastor brought both of us in and said, you guys really need to pray about being here because I don't, th- here's what, I don't think you have what it takes to be in the full-time ministry, not only at this church, but any other church. You're like, what? I just prepared four years of my life. That's a giant. You know, we had three miscarriages before we had our three kids. And at the time we were having miscarriages, other people in the church or our youth group, like two students would go out one night, like a Friday night fling, and she would get pregnant doing it the wrong way. Here we are like, hey, God, we're trying to do it the right way. Three miscarriages. But I believe that although we had three miscarriages, God gave us three kids. He's like, I got your back here. But that's a, that's a, that's a giant. Three years ago, Three years ago, and probably two weeks from now, three years ago, is when I had a brain hemorrhage. And I heard, I heard the doctor say the next day, after, he said, told the, my wife, he's going to be in ICU for 14 days. I was like, he has no idea how tough I am. He was right, 14 days. I was like, <laughs> that, that's a giant when you're not sure if you're going to live past tomorrow. That's a giant. Giants appear, I must face it. I wrote this down in my notes. Giants come suddenly and unexpectedly. Hey, so don't get mad at yourself when you... You, you weren't prepared for the giant. They come out of the blue. They come when you're not ready for it because eventually you're going to get hit. Let's keep reading in the story. Verse 20, you got, you got your Bible there? Verse 20, early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of a shepherd, loaded up and set out as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. I need you to stop here. Can you, can you see it? They're actually fighting in the, in the valley of Elah. So can you picture here, all of the Israelite armies are up on one mountain. There's a hill that goes down a ravine. Then there's another hill. And all the Philistines are up on that mountain. And verse 20 says they're shouting back and forth. I don't know what they were shouting. We got spirit. Yes, we do. We got spirit. How about you? Our spirit is God. They were just back and forth. And somebody probably said, your mama. And they said, your mama's mama. And they're just back and forth. They're, they're talking trash to one another, right? That's what's going on. Army, uh, Israeli army, one side, ravine, Philistine, back and forth. They're shouting their war cries. Verse 21, Israel, uh, verse 22, David left his things with the keeper of the supplies, ran to the battle lines and asked his brothers how they were. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath. Let me just stop there. Where was he from? He was from Gath. Check this out. This is interesting. David wasn't going to Gath, but Gath was coming to him. Ever just like, I'm going to work, and I, I didn't expect that to happen. I know, but trouble came to you. Trial came to you. A giant came to you. So the Philistine champion from Gath stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance. And David, what did David do? He, I'll come back to that. He heard it. When the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. So they were all afraid for their life. David's like, bring it on, homeboy. Verse 25, now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out 40 days, morning and night? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give him great wealth. Notice the three, three things that David gets if he takes down the giant. Number one, you get great wealth. Look at me. If, if you could overcome this giant, God's going to bless you. Number two, he says, you're going to get the king's daughter in marriage. I'm not really a big, like, royal family, what's going on in England, but I'm kind of intrigued. Like, Meghan Markle, she's just like an American who was born in L.A., little celebrity actress. So David grew up in a caste system. It's like England, right? 
If you're born into the family, there's blessings and there's provision and there's benefits to be part of the royal family. Now, Meghan Markle, just a, an American, marries into the royal family. And how many know she's able to go into the, the palace? She has privileges and benefits she would have never had if she would have never married this guy, right? So second thing, he says, David, if you take down the giant, second thing, you're going to marry my daughter. So you're going to prosper, number one. I'm going to change your position, number two. And number three, your family will be exempt from taxes. Does that sound good to anybody? That would be awesome. But notice, not just David doesn't have to pay taxes. The Bible says in verse 25, his whole family will be exempt from taxes. That's awesome. That tells me if I can overcome this giant, not only does it affect me, look at me, parents, it affects my kids. If I can walk in victory, if I can overcome this stronghold, you know, for my life, I was telling the other service, on both sides of my family, mother, father, divorce, 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 aunts and uncles, divorce, divorce, divorce. When I got married 29 years ago, it'll be 30 next June, when I got married, I drew a line in the sand, and I said, as for me and my house, we will not, my wife are not going to get a divorce. Has it been perfect? No. Have I been perfect? Yes. Has she? <laughs> Just kidding. How I many know there's no perfect marriage out there? Have we had ups and downs and struggles and disagreements? Yes. But as for me and my house, put a line in the sand and say, hey, enemy, this will not happen to me. So, Steve, if you can beat this giant, it's going to affect you and your kids and your grandkids. So we don't talk about this in the church that, listen, not only does your sin affect you and other people, your, listen, your obedience, your faithfulness will impact your kids, your grandkids, your great-grandkids, a thousand generations is what Exodus chapter 20 verse 6 says. Giants appear, I must, I must face it. I love this. David's like, you're not going to fight, you're not going to fight, you're not going to fight, she's not going to fight, he's not going to fight, he's not going to fight. I'll fight. I'll do it. The guy's just a teenager. Do we have any giant killers in the building? That was so stinking weak. Do we have any giant killers in the building? This is... Let me run. This is the last service. You've had more sleep than the other services. Do we have any giant killers in the building? All right. <laughs> Some of you are still on the ladies' thing. Uh, anyhow, uh, if you're going to kill a giant, it, it's going to require two things. Number one, write this down. It, it's going to require that you overcome first what, what I see. What I see. David went out to the battle, and what did he see? He saw he saw a giant. He saw a giant dressed in armor. He saw an army, the Philistines, bigger, badder, more experienced than his own army. He saw his own army, guys two times, three times his age, terrified and intimidated of the... So that's what he saw in the natural. Let me ask you a question. Do you see things differently than other people see things? Do you, do you only look at the obstacle? Do you only look at the problem? Do you only look at the setback? Do you only look at the speed bump? Or do you see what God sees? Listen, you're never going to overcome giants in your life if you only see things in the natural. That's why the Bible says we don't walk by, we walk by faith, not by it would, wouldn't it be awesome if God showed us everything? Okay, here's what you're going to do. Here's how you're going to respond here. Hey, tomorrow when you go to work, this is going to, that'd be great, but it doesn't happen that way. No, we walk by faith. Faith is just trusting in God. God, you're in control. You're in control. So we walk by faith, not by sight. And I, if I'm going to be victorious in this Christian life, I have to learn to overcome the things that I see in the natural. The second thing, I have to overcome what I hear what I hear. Someone say what I hear. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 8, the enemy, the devil, he goes about, walks around like a, a roaring lion. I've never been out like to the jungle. I've been to like the wild animal park. And one thing about lions is they're not like, meow. <gasps> That's the enemy right there. He goes about like a roar, roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. I was probably in, I want to say, fourth grade. And how many know there's always one kid in elementary school? I'm just talking to the guys right now. He's like head and shoulders above everybody else. You know what I'm talking about? You're in fourth grade. He's like 6'2", mustache. <laughs> probably has two of his own kids. You're like, dude, you're fifth grade. And I remember him telling me like at 9 or 9.30 in the morning, he looked at me and he said, I'm going to beat you up after school. <laughs> That's a roaring lion. 
And for the rest of the day, I couldn't add, subtract, divide. I couldn't read. Recess was wrecked. Lunch was wrecked. I, that's all I thought about the whole day. I'm going to beat you up after school. I'm going to beat you up after school. I'm going to beat you up after school. And that's all I heard. That's what I heard. That's what I heard. And the enemy beats us up based on the things that we hear. You're saying, what exactly did David hear? Actually, two things. Check out verse 23 in the text. Verse 23, as he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. I mean, that's what the devil does. You never, never amount to anything. You'll always be broke. You'll never get a job. You'll never get married. You'll never, you're, not, you're always, you never, you always, you. And he keeps saying things. And here's the thing. I can handle the devil. I can handle my enemies. That's not the problem. The problem is it's when people that, that are closest to you say things. I mean, it's the people that say, my wife can say things to me that could hurt me in ways you could never, and vice versa. It's the people that are closest to you. So he had to hear the enemy. I, I can handle that. Here's what I can't handle, verse 28. When Eliab, the older brother, Dave, David's older brother, heard him. So David's like, oh, I'm taking down the giant. Eliab, he's like, come on, man. He burned with anger at David and said, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Listen, if you're going to be victorious over the giants of your life, you have to overcome the things you see and the things you can I tell you, I hear a lot of things in our church. Just the nature of being a pastor, it's the nature of, if I were to ask today right now, hey, let's take a survey on how long the worship should be. I'd probably get 500 different responses. I think it should be like 10 minutes and then just pre. I think it should be 20 minutes. I think, Steve, you should shut up and we should just sing the whole time. I think we should do more hymns, less hymns. I don't really like the lights. I think we should have this, more of that. Everybody's got an opinion, right? And if I were to lead based on everybody's opinion on what I hear, I wouldn't be a very effective leader. People say, Pastor Steve, I don't really like the way that you're leading the church. Okay, that's fair. But what are you leading? What are you leading? You know, we have those little connect cards and people put all kinds of comments in there. I don't read them like 99% of the time because like, I think, we did, I think we should, and it's always anonymous. I'm like, would you grow up and pick up the phone if you have an issue? Just be man or woman about it and say, hey, I'm having a, but anonymous. I think, Pastor Steve, I don't like his G. I don't like, all right, great. Pastor Steve, I, I think you're a little too, too strong on your kids, maybe too, too disciplined. Is that the case, or you just let your kids do whatever they want? Hold on. Thank you, brother. I'll meet you after this service. I need some bodyguards. By the way, I know that I'm preaching good when it's silent in here. When everybody's like, hey, man, read that song. It's like not very good, but when it's silent, it's like, oh, I struck a chord. I've heard things about like, well, you just take a, like a hard stance on alcohol and a hard stance on dating and hard stance. Oh, is that the case? Is that really the case? Or are you just like anything goes? You have no boundaries and I'm a Christian. I'm free in Jesus. I get free to do whatever. Is that the case? Or am, am I really legalistic? Or are you just like anything goes? I just live however I want in the end. God's going to make it okay. So listen, if you're going to overcome giants, you have to, you have to be willing to hear some things that you might not like. That, that, that people might not agree with you, right? If you're going to overcome a giant, things that I see, i got to overcome that, things that I hear, I better get going because I'm getting some nasty looks. So let's move on to the second point. Are you ready? Ready for some good news? Number two, so, so giants appear, i got to face it. Here's the good news. Number two, victory is assured. Victory is assured. I need to find it. Victory is assured. I need to find it. Can you go ahead and say that out loud so I can stall and take a sip of water while you're doing that at the count of three. One, two, three. So I got to find it. Now the giants are coming, but I love this. Victory is assured. You're like, where did you get that in the Bible? Ready to read? Verse 32 and three. David said to Saul, the king at the time, let no one lose heart on account of the Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Love that. The king's like, you're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man. And he has been a warrior from his youth. This is like put down number 217 for David. But David said to Saul, verse 34, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. That is just awesome right there. You went after the lion and the bear? Yeah, I went after it. Struck it, rescued the sheep from its mouth, went... 
Your servant has killed both lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. Just say, awesome. The Lord who rescued me from the paw and the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. How many know that's just awesome confidence in God? Verse 40, then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistines. How many would just be like, I'm not approaching, I'm going the other way. That would have probably been me. You're approaching the giant, I'm going the other way. Verse 41, meanwhile, the Philistine with a shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David. I'm, I'm just thinking like the jaws. Dun, 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 dun. Verse 42, he looked David over and saw that he is a little more than a boy, glowing with wealth, health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Verse 44, come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin? But I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. I just think when he said that, when he said that, all the Israelites were like, "Ah!" and only three people cheered. So I'm going to give you another run out. I'll read at the end of verse 45 and you can cheer. Ready? But I come to you in the name of the Lord Almighty. That's awesome. The God of the armies of Israel whom you have defiled. So here it is. Victory is assured. I got to understand these two things. Number one, write it down. Number one, I got to understand the reason why I fight. The reason why I fight. So David's like, hey, you can mess with me. You can talk about me. You can say things about me. It's not about my name or my fame or my cause. The reason why I'm going to take down the giant is for the fame and the name and the cause of Jesus Christ. Do you know there are, how many moms do we have in the house, moms? And how many, there are some, some of you, you're really quiet, gentle, introverted, passive. But I'll bet you if somebody messes with your kids, They go, how many know, you get a quiet mama, you mess with the kids, she goes, psycho. <laughs> Jeffrey Dahmer, I mean, just like crazy, right? You know what I'm talking about? And why? And, and this is true about my, you could say things about me, write things about me, I, I could care less. You mess with my wife and kids, is on, is on. And David's like, hey, you can talk about me, you can talk about the Israelite army, you can talk about my brothers, you can talk about my, but you can't talk about my dad, my heavenly father. It's the cause of Christ, the name of God. How many, just, how many of you have ever gotten a little pushback from people in your life because you stood up for something? You stood up for God. You stood up for Jesus. You stood up for the church. And they're, eh, huh, raise your hand, right? A little pushback. And some of you that don't have your hand up, that's a really sad commentary. If you never get any pushback, that tells me that you're probably not taking hard stances for Jesus. Because when you take hard stances for Jesus and say, in other words, when I play racquetball, you can say this and you can cuss here, you can cuss here. The, name, the second you use God's name in vain, I stop the game and say, excuse me, I would prefer if you not say GD because that's offensive to me. You can say SH, you can say any other word you want. You cannot use the name of my God in vain. That's the reason why we fight for the name and the fame of Jesus Christ. Let me remind us at our church, we don't have big chairs up here. We're not trying to promote anybody's name. We're not, I I don't want to be famous at all. I don't, who cares if you even know what my name is, anything about our family. We're just trying to elevate and exalt one name, the name of Jesus Christ. That's the reason why we are in a battle. The reason to fight, number two, write the second thing down. The second thing is this. Number two is the resources to fight. The resources, let me say this. You will, you will never defeat the giants of your life if you don't believe what you have is enough. David's like, hey, I don't need an army to help me, my brothers to affirm me, Saul's armor to dress me, or my dad and my older brother to believe in me. What I have is enough. In fact, I want you to say that out loud. What I have is enough. What you have is enough. What you have is more than enough. You say, man, I I just got saved a a week ago, a month ago. It's more than enough. I never graduated high school or college. It's more than enough. What, honestly, what did David have in the natural? He had five stones and a slingshot. That's not big enough, good enough to take down of a, a giant, but it was enough. How about this? It's not necessarily what you have. It's how you perceive what you have. It's what you look at 
what you have. Not necessarily, it's not the five stones in the sling, it's how you look at that. If you just decide, hey, that's more than enough to take down the giant, it's more than enough. Let me also add this, how many rocks did it take to take down the giant? I didn't have time to study this. Just kidding. How many? One. One. So I'm not a big math guy. I didn't really do good in math at school, but I think I got this down. He began with five stones. He used one stone, and he still had four stones left. Do you know, somebody told me last week that there's one denomination in the United States that says if you're over the age of 50, you cannot be a senior pastor at any church in the United States because you're too old at 50. And I would say, hey, if you're 60, 70, 80, you still have something left over. You still have enough. You never graduated high school or college. You have enough. You said, I just got saved a month ago. You have enough. You've been divorced. You have enough. I'm preaching better than you're responding. You had an abortion. You have enough. You have to look at what you have as being enough. I want to be honest with you. There's never been a time in my life where I ever felt like it was enough. Like when I got married, I'm like, I, my dad wasn't a Christian father. I don't even know. Well, what does it mean to be a Christian husband? I, I felt like I, I didn't have enough to be a good Christian father. You figure it out. You ask people, how many of you as a parent, first kid comes out and you're like, man, I, I know exactly how to, I, I didn't. If that, it's like, I don't even know what to do. I felt as a father, I didn't have enough. I felt as a church planter, I felt as a youth pastor. I, I feel like that today as a senior pastor, as a leader of a church of 4,000 and growing. I don't have enough, but I have enough because it's Christ in me. It's the Holy Spirit. And check it out. And if I have the Holy Spirit living in me, a group of supported people around me, a pastoral staff, a gift that God's given me, access to the throne of God, prayers that I could pray. I don't have to be the most eloquent, gifted person. I have enough. I have enough. Let's read the rest of the story. Verse 47. Verse 47. All those gathered here will know that it's not by sword or spear that the Lord says, for the battle is the Lord's. Somebody need to hear that today. The battle is the Lord's. And he will give all of you into your hands as the Philistine moved closer to the attack. David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. Awesome. This is so great. This is like gory. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone with a sword in his hand. He struck down the Philistine and killed him. Read the rest of the uh, chapter. He cuts off Goliath's head. Oh, he's walking around town with a head, puts it in his tent, just like totally takes down the giants. Awesome. Verse 47, the battle's the Lord's. I don't know what you're faced with today, but I came to church to tell you the battle's the Lord's. And you know, when I say that, here's what a lot of people think, oh, okay, the battle's the Lord's. I'm off the hook. No, you're on the hook. I want to talk about that verse, the battle's the Lord's. So okay if I come down here and sit? Just make sure I don't. Some people think, okay, the battle's the Lord's. I'm 42 and I'm still not married. I want to get married so bad. The battle's the Lord. Pastor Steve, you just said the battle's the Lord. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to sit in my apartment. I'm not going to go to church. The battle's the Lord's. He's going to find somebody for me. It's his battle. I'm not going to go to the gym and work out. I'm not going to live my life. I'm not going to work. I'm just going to stay home. And the battle's the Lord's. He's just going to drop like a Christian Brad Pitt from the ceiling one day and the battle's the Lord. No, no. Put on some makeup, ladies. I'm talking about ladies right now. Go to church, go to work, go to the gym. You do your part and it just might happen that you might run into somebody at church. When you look over and you're like, whoa. Do your part. Guys, take a shower. Put on some cologne. Do your part. And how many know God will do his part? It cracks me out the numbers of people that get into financial crisis. God, I need, I need you, God. Okay, but are you tithing? So you, you want the blessing of God financially, and you're not even willing to do the bare minimum. He's like, no, I'll do my part. You got to first do your part. I didn't think I'd get a whole lot of amens on that. No, but I, I want the blessing of God, the provision of God, the healing of God, but I don't want to do my part. He's like, no, not going to happen that way. Do your part. I know, but I just, just haven't been able to get a job for like two weeks, and now it's three weeks. I'm just going to, here's, I heard this. I heard this recently. A friend of mine, he was just sitting at home. He wasn't working either, and, and he got a knock on the door, and UPS opened it up, and they gave him a, a letter. It was a certified letter. It was like a $10,000 check. 
And if he can do it for him, he'll do it for me. Now, how many know God can do that? But typically, that's not how it rolls. Here's how it rolls. Ready? Fill out a resume. Go, go to some interviews. Dress nicely. Put the flip-flops and the shorts away. Put on a nice outfit. Go down there. Present yourself well. Do your part. Do a back. Do all that. And then maybe God just might give you a good job. Do, a, do your part. God will make up the difference. This is all over the Bible. You're like, well, where? I could start with 2 Kings chapter 4, one of my favorite stories. So lady, right, her husband was in ministry. He dies. She has two boys. The creditors are coming to take her kids. Elijah the prophet shows up and says, hey, what do you have in your house to pay off the debt? She's like, nothing. He says, no, you need to look around again. She looks in the cupboard and she pulls out a jar of oil. How, how's that going to help? I just lost my husband. The creditors are coming to take my two kids and oil? The prophet's like, yeah, here's what you need to do. I want you to go to all your neighbors, knock on their door, and borrow empty jars. By the way, just imagine that. Knock, knock, knock. Hey, how you doing? Yeah, it's John from down the street. I was just wondering, can, uh, can I borrow some jars? Uh, yeah, what do you need it for? I don't know. <laughs> how many do you need? I don't know. Uh, what are you going to bring them back? I don't know. So he goes house one, house two, house, gets all these empty jars, goes into the kitchen and just starts pouring. And when she starts pouring, God starts multiplying. So how, you know, what did she do? Well, she had to go borrow jars. I love the story of Jesus turning water into wine. We all love that story, right? Water into wine, that's great. But we always forget the fact that the disciples had to go fill up the empty jugs with water. One of my favorite stories is the, the paralyzed guy. He's paralyzed, right? Four friends carry him to Jesus. Remember that? It's a great story. Think about that. Four guys in ancient Israel just to get their schedules together. We would be like, hey, let me, I'll text you and we're going to meet down here at, at the court of Gonzales and Rose and we're going to meet. No, no, back down. What are you like? Hey, the, see that big rock there? There's a tree behind the rock. We're going to meet up there. And so they finally get the front on the stretcher. They carry them across rocky and dirty terrain. They make it to the house. What happened at the house? I didn't have time to read this. Packed. Because Jesus is doing a Bible study. So they get up on top of the roof, dig a hole in the roof, and lower their friend. Notice all the things they did. They had to get their schedules together. They had to bring their friend to Jesus. They had to climb to the second story. They had to rip the building down. They had to lower their friend. This is all over the Bible. God fed 20,000 people, but he needed a little boy's lunch to do it. Story after story after story. I have a part. God has a part. I have a part. Yes, the battle is the Lord's, but you have your part to play. Now, remember what I said at the very beginning of the sermon, 40 days. Someone say 40, 40. Do you know the number 40 in the Bible is a, it's a number that talks about testing and trials. Moses went up on Mount Sinai for how many days? 40 days. If you know anything about the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel had to lay on his right side for 40 days before God healed him. Elijah went 40 days without food and water. Moses and the Israelites were stuck in the wilderness for how many years? 40 years. Jesus was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days. How many disciples did Jesus have? 12, just to see if you're, <laughs> just to see if you're still awake. Not 40, 12. But 40 in the Bible is the number for testing. Here's what I believe as I was putting my message together. Some of you have been fighting, huge giants. Some of you, you got a bad diagnosis recently. Some of you, you're here today and your spouse is not with you because you're you're having major conflict in your marriage. Some of your, your kids have gone south. And when I, mean, when I say south, I mean I don't want to go to church. I will not go to church. Stop telling me about Jesus. Some of you went for an annual checkup and you got really bad news from the doctor. And you've been in a season of trials and testing. And I came to church to bring you some good news. I believe for some people today is day 41 for somebody. Today the trial's over. Today the test is over. Today the giant is defeated. Today victory is yours. Would you go ahead and stand to your feet? Let's put our hands together and thank God. Come on, let's put our hands together and thank God for the victory that's ours. Thank God for the giant that's been defeated. Come on, put your hands together and give him praise. Hey, look at me, look at me. Victory is yours. You have enough. Stop looking at what you don't have. Jesus never says, hey, look at what you don't have. He says, just look at what you do have. 
I have people around me that love me. I have, have you ever, I have access to God. I don't have to go to a priest. I can, Hebrews 4.16. Come boldly to the throne of grace where you can find mercy. I can go right, I go right to the heavenly father and say, God, I'm, I've got a, a giant. I, don't, I, I know that you know about it, but I, I just want to ask you to help me as it relates to this giant. We go right to the father. We got the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. We have the word of the living God. We have friends and family that are there here to support us. We have the victory. It's assured. The battle is the Lord. Do your part. And listen, breakthrough is coming. Victory is coming. I cannot wait. I cannot wait. I cannot wait to read the emails that are going to come in this week of the healings, of the reconciliations, of the new jobs, of the promotions. I can't wait to read the connect cards that come in and say, man, I was faced this when I came in on Sunday, July 22nd. Here's what God's done in my life since then. Listen, do your part. What you have is enough. God will make up the difference. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Father, we thank you for your grace. Thank you for your power. Thank you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. God, thank you that what we have is enough. Giants are coming. They're intimidating. They're frightening. But Lord, even as David said, if he won't do it, if she won't do it, if he won't do it, I'm going to do it. I'll step up. I'll step out. I'll fight this giant because it's the bat. The battle is the Lord's, declares God. So I thank you, Lord God. It's Christ in me, the hope of glory. I thank you that what I have is more than enough. And for your sons and daughters, my brothers and sisters, I pray that victory would be their portion even today. Some of them facing a huge medical diagnosis, a financial challenge. They're not even sure how they're going to pay the bills for this month. But God, you're going to come through as we do our part. God, we pray that you would do your part. We love you. We bless you. We honor you. In the powerful name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And all of God's people said.